how to follow God over your flesh. Be nice, have fun, play nice with the other kids. Unless the other kids wanna fight, then you kick the other kids with at least a little hostile flesh, don't you think? Everybody has flesh. On this side of the gray, it's impossible to get rid of it. It comes in many flavors. A new, a few of the most popular include performance flesh, religious flesh, superior flesh, victim flesh, pleaser flesh, hostile flesh. Because everyone has flesh, you might think it's acceptable, but it's not. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Contrary to the Spirit doesn't sound acceptable to me. You might be tempted to shirk off your flesh with a wing, but you don't have to look far to see the devastation it causes in marriages. By now, you should have the mantra memorized. A great marriage comes from two people walking in the spirit, loving one another. The antithesis is also true. A bad marriage comes from two people walking in the flesh, battling one another. When two people walking in the flesh cross paths, collision often occurs and mutual love never occurs. Think about it. What are your flesh patterns? How do they affect your most important relationships? Holy Spirit, I need you to break in right now. Show me the negative contrary effects of walking in the flesh. Make me willing to let you take control of these deadly tendencies so that I might walk in your ways. Amen. What is nailed to your cross? Crucifixion Produce death not suddenly but gradually True Christians Do not succeed in completely destroying it That is the flesh While here below But they have fixed it to the cross And they are determined to keep it there till it expires Christianity is pretty crazy stuff. Its way are so backwards from the things we have learned, so much so that we might overlook the principles that can free us from the way things work in the world. That's true when it comes to issues of death and life, because the scripture says that life only comes through death. Galatians, for I was crucified when Christ and I no longer live, but Christ live in me. That key passage is echoed by numerous others. They all talk about who we are in our spirit, about the transformation that Christ brought about by his a co-crucifixion with us and he's raising again to new life so we can be born again but what about the flesh because the best marriages are two people walking in the spirit loving one another and the flesh tries to get in the way of that how do we overcome the flesh those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What does it mean to crucify the flesh? Well, this is not the same crucifixion that Paul describes in Galatians and Romans 6. Crucifying the flesh is different. The commentator puts it this way. 
The basic demand of Christian discipleship is that we take up our cross daily and follow cross. As long as we are here on earth, we are never going to be done with the flesh. It's always going to be part of our life, but letting it control us is always optional. When we are in the flesh, we can respond uh, in the spirit. Recognize our flesh and see it for what it is. See its effects and hate them. Accept that God's spirit in us is greater than the flesh. Declare that the flesh has no more power over us. Turn towards the love and will of God to take its place. For the reveal one aspect of my flesh we can deal with right now. Let me affix it to the cross until that day I see you face to face. Amen. If you written prayer, if you should ask me for an epitome of the Christian, I should say that it is in one word, prayer. You hear that word a lot. It's all over the Bible. You hear it in passing conversations. It's preached about in sermons gulare. But what comes to mind when you hear the word prayer, though, how does it make you feel? At the end of Ephesians, when Paul finished talking about the spiritual armor and the spiritual warfare, he concludes with this exhortation to prayer. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may uh, declare it uh, fearlessly as I should. This passage is so abundant. It's worth uh, dissecting uh, thought by thought to consider some misguided ideas we've inherited on prayer what it is, what it sounds like, and how often we are supposed to do it, but probably don't. It's time to rethink prayer as it relates to the radical truth about who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. Looking at things from that perspective can just as radically alter your practice of prayer and transform your life in powerful way. Jesus, I am curious. I take prayer for granted and do it according to what I am. I have learned uh, through traditions and the example of others. Renew my mind about prayer according to the truth of who I am in you and who you are in me. Empower me to pray in the spirit of all occasions. Amen. Pastor Pete Berisco tells, are you doing good for the wrong reason? The first thing you have to know is yourself. A man who knows himself can step outside himself and watch his own reactions like an observer. Recognizing the flesh is easy when it has negative expression. It is easy to see the junk when performance flesh burns us out, when superior flesh lashes out, or when caretaker flesh perpetuates destructive relationships. But sometimes 
the flesh manifests itself in ways that seem positive. Is it wrong to want to please people? Is it wrong to want to perform well? The answer has more to do with the why than the what. One of my own flesh patterns is the preserved flesh. I do things for others so they will like me. Pete says back before Libby and I figured out this whole crucify the flesh thing. I would uh, sense that she was upset with me and would try to please her to earn her acceptance by cleaning the kitchen. She'd see it clean and became angry. He continues disappointed, I'd say. How could you be mad at me? I just cleaned the whole kitchen. But one time she said, I don't know why I am mad. It Pete asked, why did my attempt to please her feel yucky? Because I was cleaning the kitchen to manipulate her, to get her to like me, to control our relationship. He tells I learned a lot about my flesh from the experience but I could have just as easily learned it first from the world and save us a lot of pain. Pete wonders am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Pete asks, is there anything wrong with cleaning the kitchen? Of course not. If you are walking in the spirit, you may get a completely different reaction of the same action. Why? Because in the spirit, I am serving her to love her. In the flesh, I am. Serving her to the get something. Do you see the difference? It doesn't guarantee that your action in the spirit will have the desired effect, but at least it could. Flesh stinks even uh, when doing good things, and your spouse can sniff it at a mile away. Father, I want to crucify my flesh. If I am doing things for the wrong reasons, change my heart so they would be done without my personal agenda. Amen. How you can get in line with God's Spirit? He who knows others in is wise. He who knows himself is enlightened. Hopefully we've put some meat on the selection of a great marriage comes from two people walking in the spirit loving one another. Now I am going to ask you to take another step. First take the list of flesh flavors and go away and pray. Say, Lord Jesus, by your spirit reveal the filth of my flesh. I want to hate it. I want to nail it to the cross. Performance flesh, religious flesh, superior flesh, comfort flesh, victim flesh, caretaker flesh, pleaser flesh, indulgent flesh, hostile flesh. Then get together with your spouse and have a conversation like this. Here's what the Holy Spirit revealed to me about my flesh. Tell them what He's told you. Asking for forgiveness where necessary. The key words here are my flesh, not your flesh. Pete Berisco says, when Libby and I did this, I said, you know what, I've got some please their flesh and some passive flesh and she said yeah yeah I see that your response will be a wonderful conf uh, confirmation of what the Holy Spirit is saying to you we prayed about it and then were able to begin walking together in the spirit following the spirit's promptings in new ways 
that might be a radical step for you to take, but I pray that you will take it in faith. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in a step with the Spirit. The Spirit is in you. Take some time and then get in a step with what He is doing. Holy Spirit, thank you for being a constant presence in my life. Give me the faith to take practical, even radical action to keep in a step with you so that you can love my spouse and other through me in a way that might lead to great relationships. Amen. Truth to set your marriage free by Pastor Pete Brisco. Marriage, a legal or religious ceremony by which two persons of the opposite sex solemnly agreed to harass and spy on each other for 99 years or until death do them join. Late one night, about five years ago, Pete and his wife found themselves sitting in their kitchen. They started talking and it went something like this. Libby, Okay, we really need to talk. Pete, okay, let's talk. Libby, I am so angry at you, I can barely stand it. Pete, why? Libby, I don't, I'm not even sure why. I am just uh, sitting with anger. Pete, well, you know what? I am angry at you too, Libby. You know, I don't even like you anymore. Pete, I don't like you either. They just started at each other, silence for the longest time. It was a defining moment. They realized that the marriage they had constructed was a poor imitation of what God really had for them. They've learned a lot since then, and they've become more convinced of a simple truth. Satan divides and the Holy Spirit units. Satan is at work in our marriages, our families, and our friendships, and some of his favorite tools are his lies. If you believe those lies, your relationships can disintegrate before your eyes at least. That's what happened to us. Paul laid out a counter attack have nothing to do with the fruitless and deeds of darkness but rather expose them it is shameful even to mention what did this uh, obedient do in secret but everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light this is why it is said wake up sleeper rise from the dead and christ will shine on you amen that night in the kitchen they decided that they were going to put in the hard work learn to be painfully painfully honest and ask christ to give them the marriage that he longed for them to have if you feel trapped like they did the truth can set your marriage free. Father, expose the lies of darkness that I have accepted as true. Wake me, elevate me, shine the light of Jesus on my home and my relationships. Amen. Is marriage still relevant? By Pete Briscoe. Getting married for six is like buying a seven for seven for the free peanuts. A few years back, the Pev Paul reported that 44% of Americans under 30 believe marriage is heading for extinction, but 95% of Americans want to get married someday. That's interesting, isn't it? 
they know there is something dynamic and special about this relationship but our culture keeps saying marriage was great for your grandparents but it's unnecessary today time magazine ran a cover that simply asked who needs marriage how would you answer marriage is an archaic institution irrelevant for enlightened modern people many believe this lie the rest of us need to ask ourselves if marriage is worth it that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh this is the way God always intended it one man one woman coming together becoming one enjoying on oneness in Christ it's God's original plan and it means to last he's never re- re- rescinded it marriage is simply one of God's great ideas I have done dozens of weddings over the years and I start them all the same way marriage is a holy state instituted by God commanded for all who enter it lawfully and in true affection consecrated by Christ's presence at the marriage feast in Cana of Galilee set forth as signifying the mystical union between Christ and the church ordained for the consecration of union between man and woman so that natural instincts directed a right they might live in purity and honor ordained for the increase of mankind and that children might be brought up in the fear and the nature of the Lord ordained for companion, uh, companionship health and comfort ordained for the welfare of human society which can be strong and happy only where the marriage bond is held highly in honor satan lies the truth is that marriage is divine timeless and significant marriage is part of god's eternal purpose and it will be until death we do part God, when I begin to doubt the validity of marriage, convict me of your purpose in marriage for my good and your glory. Amen. Time together is important. Effective prayer. Now a good time for you to steal away to a quiet, scheduled place to pray. Why? Because quiet time is essential for any thriving relationship, but especially your relationship with God the Father. In the Bible you learn how your relationship with God will thrive when you spend time with Him and how the effectiveness of prayer isn't based on your our own abilities, but the ability of the one to whom you pray and answers your prayer. Now is the time for prayer. In moments of great need, we turn to our friends where it's safe to be vulnerable, share openly what's troubling us and humbly receive their love and comfort. There is no greater friend than Jesus and he is eager to hear what's troubling your heart today. Jesus helps you revitalize your prayer life in Christ through the Bible teaching of telling the truth. What really makes you happy? One is the loneliness number that you will ever do. Two can be as bad as one. It's the loneliness number since the number one.
Christian colleges can be like meat markets. Church single groups can be the same. Sometimes I wonder if the singles in those classes are into God or into the look of the person next to them. Are they following the Holy Spirit or their hormones? Sure, there is a natural attraction to get married, but the desire can also be part of a deep emotional deception that lures uh, people out of trust and contentment in Christ. Lie number two, you cannot be happy unless you are married. Think you have to be married to be whole and happy. Get this, Paul spends the whole capture of 1 Cor uh, Corinthians 7 convicting people not to get married. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. I wish that all men were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried. I would like you to be free from uh, concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Do you believe that you can't be ha happy unless you are married? The truth is this, singleness is either a gift to cherish or a season to enjoy. The loneliest people I know are not single adults. The loneliest people are people I know trapped in a bad marriage. Marriage is not the happiness pill a lot of people think it is. If you want to be happy in marriage, remember that true joy and fulfillment are found only in Christ period. God, your word says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. I lay claim uh, to that truth right here, right now, no matter what my circumstances might be. Turn my heart towards you as my source of true fulfillment, filling me until I am full in need of nothing else. Amen.